My ex-girlfriend was a rich second generation, one of those extremely wealthy types, but when she was with me, she always pretended to be poor. For three whole years, she lived off me, ate my food, and even the underwear she wore were the cheap ones I bought for her. Ten pairs for nine, nine yuan on a group deal. I thought she was a poor campus belle, orphaned and struggling alone in society, only to realize she was a rich little princess who was used to feasting on delicacies, and just wanted to try some simple kanji and pickles for a change. Chapter 1 I opened the trending video on the top of the hot search. The woman was lazily leaning against a luxury car, giving a faint smile towards the camera. The person filming was clearly a man. As the camera shook, followed by an eruption of screams, she's looking at me, she's really beautiful. After that, the video ended and looped back to the beginning. In those mere 10 seconds, I watched it dozens of times. The video had come out yesterday, titled, Andrew attends event with newcomer, suspected romance exposed. Andrew is a newly crowned best actor a wealthy CEO, and is known for his genuine personality in the entertainment industry. At 30, he's still unmarried, but never hides his relationships. Each new girlfriend is younger and more beautiful than the last. Every time a new relationship is exposed, there are countless people begging him to hold classes and teach them how to be a player. Some even joke that, while an 18-year-old girl is just reaching adulthood, it's already too late for her to be Andrew's girlfriend. When the video first surfaced, my best friend Ryan forwarded it to me immediately. He jokingly asked, this beauty looks like Veronica, what's going on? Don't tell me you were so broke that you forced her into the entertainment industry to sell herself for fame. Before I had time to reply, Ryan sent another message, holy crap, it's not just similar, it is Veronica, go check the trending search, only then, confused, did I click on the hot search, and there it was, right at the top, that very video. I couldn't believe that such a simple piece of entertainment news could take so many twists and turns. At first. People said Veronica was a freshman at the film academy, and that she was with Andrew for money and fame, trying to break into the entertainment industry. But soon, someone debunked that, saying Veronica wasn't from the film academy at all. She was the campus belle of a university, with an average family background. She had to work part-time to pay her tuition, and was probably with Andrew because she needed money. They even posted her student ID as proof. However, not long after, the story flipped again. Someone uncovered that Veronica was actually the little princess of Pinnacle Group, the only daughter of CEO Martin. Not only was she a rich second generation, but she was a top tier one, too. She kept a low profile, and her part-time jobs were just to prove her own abilities. And since childhood, Andrew had always been her ideal type. She had pursued him for five years, but he had never responded. This time, Veronica made a high-profile appearance because Andrew had been bullied by the event organizers. She came out in full force to defend her idol showing up in a luxury car to support the men she loved. Andrew's acceptance of her presence was also seen as his indirect acknowledgement of her feelings. Soon after, along with the trending search came a photo. Veronica was glaring fiercely at a short, chubby middle-aged woman, and Andrew, usually tall, handsome, and exuding cold restraint, stood behind her, eyes filled with nothing but indulgence and tenderness. When that photo surfaced, the trending search exploded. Though the photo was blurry, it carried the vibe of a dramatic love story, glamorous. Loyal rich beauty ex charismatic playboy star captivated. Meanwhile, my WeChat chat with Veronica was still stuck on last night's conversation. She had said to me, I'm so tired, I miss you, let's go have hot pot tomorrow. Okay. How did I respond again? Oh, right, I said. Don't work yourself too hard. If the part time job is exhausting, just quit. I have money. Worst case, I'll support you. But looking back now, my act of pretending to be rich in front of Veronica seems like a joke. After all, the Veronica in the video was wearing all kinds of luxury brands I didn't recognize, and just the watch on her wrist was worth over a million yuan. And here I was, a guy earning less than 10,000 yuan a month, trying to act rich in front of her. The link I sent her still hadn't been replied to, I kept typing and deleting in the chat box, but I still didn't know what to say, I wanted to ask her what was going on, whether she was really a rich second generation, and what her relationship with Andrew was, even though the trending search was blowing up. I still held onto a sliver of hope, hoping she would explain everything herself, telling me it was all a misunderstanding, that she had lied to me, but only because she had no choice, but unexpectedly, before I could type a single word after all my edits and deletions, I received a message from her first, just three words, let's break up, I was stunned and quickly typed out my question, why, I'm done playing, oh, and the stuff you left at my place, throw it away, it's not worth anything anyway, chapter 2. I was dragged out by Ryan for drinks, he said it was rare for me to have a breakup, and if I didn't drown my sorrows in alcohol, 
It would be a waste of the dog food he had eaten for the past three years. The bar was full of neon lights, and the environment was noisy. Ryan clinked glasses with me and advised, It's no big deal, Veronica is so beautiful. It wasn't a loss to sleep with her, with your salary. You wouldn't even be able to afford to keep a girl like her, you're lucky. I downed my glass and frowned at Ryan. Don't talk about a girl like that. He gave a sheepish smile. All right, all right, let's just drink. The music was deafening, though Ryan said we should drink. His tolerance was terrible, and after a few drinks, he was already starting to get tipsy. Meanwhile, I had work tomorrow. Seeing the unanswered tags from the client group, I sighed deeply. A working man doesn't deserve to drown his sorrows in alcohol. After dropping Ryan off at his doorstep, I took a cab back home. Honestly, I felt like crying but held it in. I also wanted to send her a message but held that in too. More than anything, I felt absurd. I had really been saving money, planning to buy a house and put her name on it. After all, she had told me her family was poor and that she always felt insecure because of it. But now, were the three years we spent together all fake? She just said, I'm done playing, and that was it. I leaned my head against the window, the bumpy road knocking against my head again and again. Finally, I got home. As soon as I got out of the car, a gust of wind hit me, making me feel even dizzier. I sat down on the roadside, deciding to wait until I sobered up a bit before going upstairs. But before long, someone walked over and blocked the streetlight. I looked up and saw Veronica's face. She had changed into a pure black dress. Her hair styled in large waves draping over her back. And her expensive accessories made her look even more dazzling. She looked less and less like someone from my world. She stared down at me from above. Why are you so pathetic? Can't bear to let me go. I froze. Unsure of what to say. Her gaze was cold. Like that of a stranger. I had never seen her like this before. She used to always smile. And when our eyes met. She would suddenly lean over and hug me. Asking in a playful tone, did you love me a little more today? I always shook my head and said no, and then she would tickle me until I admitted it. Now, those memories made my heart ache. I took a deep breath, holding back tears, and tried to stay calm as I asked her, why? She didn't say anything, just waved her hand. A Maybach drove up from the corner and stopped nearby. The door opened, and a few people got out. Among them was a girl with flamboyant red hair. She walked up to me and stood in front of me, asking, you still remember me? You broke ass, do you remember who I am? It took me a long time to match the face in front of me with the one from my memory. Cecilia. Well, look at that. You remember. I thought you would have forgotten by now. Cecilia stepped aside and hooked her arm through Veronica's. The way she grinned was exactly the same as four years ago. I had met Cecilia in my second year of college when I was studying at a university. To make ends meet, I worked part-time, one of which was as a tutor. Cecilia was my first student. Her family was well off, but her grades were terrible and she loved to play around. The first lesson, she was well behaved, but by the second, she started scheming. She tossed me 500 yuan, asking me to cover for her skipping class. Then, she tried to climb out the window to go to a party. I didn't take the money, but I couldn't stop her either. Worried something might happen, I called her mom, but to my surprise, her mother, who seemed so gentle in front of me, turned out to be overly strict when disciplining her child. Cecilia got slapped and was grounded for a long time. After that, she started to hold a grudge against me. She would come to a university to harass me, shouting that I should pay for what I did and demanding an apology. But taking money to tutor and informing parents if the child left was part of my job. The fact that she got punished was beyond my control. I felt bad but didn't think I had done anything wrong. So, I just ignored Cecilia, acting as if she didn't exist. Eventually, she really stopped showing up. At the time, I thought she had gotten over it, but I never expected to see her again under such circumstances. Cecilia observed my expression, seeming to know I had figured everything out. She arrogantly pointed to Veronica and said, This is my sister, you know, she only got with you to get back at me. Veronica frowned, as if wanting to say something but staying silent, but I understood everything. My face went through a range of emotions. For this, I suddenly felt like laughing, and I did laugh. I looked up at Cecilia and asked, So now, you've had your revenge, right, are we even? Cecilia froze. Clearly not expecting this reaction from me, she frowned, hesitated a bit, and then nodded. I guess, yeah, I've had my fun, but, aren't you angry? I shook my head, laughing even more. There's nothing to be angry about. You win some, you lose some. Well then, I'll head home now. Ladies, have fun. With that, I turned and left. As I went upstairs, I could vaguely hear murmurs behind me. No way, this guy isn't sad at all. He should be, right? Did Veronica lose her charm? After three years, and he didn't fall for her. Chapter 3. Morning. After turning off the alarm, I lay in bed staring at the ceiling. My mind was in a mess. 
I didn't sleep well last night. Or rather, I barely slept at all, because I had gone online searching for answers, asking, how can I quickly move on after a breakup? The top answers were, cry, find something to do, read, and reflect. But after sitting on the couch for a long time, I just couldn't cry, so I decided to start packing my things, getting ready to move out. This apartment has two bedrooms and a living room, though it's big. It's actually a bit far from my workplace. If it weren't for her, I wouldn't have rented it in the first place. Now that we've broken up, I can move out without hesitation. However, while packing, I realized that Veronica's belongings weren't much, and most of them were things I had bought for her. No wonder she said she didn't want them anymore, because, honestly, they weren't worth much. I got into bed at 4 in the morning. I turned off the lights, tossed and turned, staring at my phone, refreshing the screen over and over, switching between apps, but none of the words on the screen registered in my mind, until the faint sunlight seeped through the curtains, and then the alarm rang. I got up with two dark circles under my eyes, showered, changed clothes. After a few sets of strength training, I finally felt a bit more alive, looking less like a ghost. I grabbed my bag and prepared to head out for the usual crowded subway ride, but suddenly, there was a knock on the door. Confused, I withdrew my hand from the doorknob and looked through the peephole. All I saw was a blur of red in the frame. Hesitating for a moment, I opened the door. To my surprise, I found myself face to face with Cecilia, who had almost bumped into the door. I was taken aback, instinctively frowning. What are you doing here? Her eyes lit up, like she had just seen her savior. She shoved everything she was holding in her hands toward me. Um. I came to apologize. I'm sorry. It was all my fault before. I was petty. I'm sorry. Can you please forgive me? I took a few steps back, not taking the things she was holding. They were a few fancy gift bags, all of them stamped with luxury logos, and one bag even had cash inside. What's this supposed to mean? Seeing I wasn't taking anything, Cecilia's expression turned defeated. I just want to apologize. Really? I stared at her for a few seconds and asked, Did Veronica send you? She was stunned and shook her head. No, no, Veronica doesn't know about this. A man's voice suddenly interrupted Cecilia's stammering. I'm the one who sent her. Sorry about that, Mr. Law. The voice was followed by a man emerging from the staircase. He was wearing a mask and sunglasses, wrapped up tightly, so I couldn't make out his features, but he was tall and well-built, dressed in understated yet high-quality clothes, clearly showing his status. He took a few steps forward, standing next to Cecilia. Then, in front of me, he took off his sunglasses and extended his hand. Hello, let me introduce myself. I'm Andrew. I'm Cecilia's brother. I heard about the prank they played on you, so I brought her here to apologize. Andrew was Cecilia's brother. I was a bit surprised, but thinking it over, it made sense. Veronica was friends with Cecilia, and had publicly defended Andrew against event organizers, since they were all rich kids in the same circle. It was only natural they knew each other, but I still shook my head at what he said next. You don't have to apologize to me. No, this was all Cecilia's fault. She was being childish. Veronica only got involved because Cecilia wouldn't stop pestering her. So ultimately, I didn't raise my sister well. Apologizing is the least we can do. While he spoke, he took the bags from Cecilia's hands and firmly pushed them into mine, saying, These are just small gifts we picked up along the way. Consider them compensation. And by the way, Veronica and I are about to get engaged. I know you two dated for a while. But everyone knows that was just a misunderstanding. So I hope you won't bother her in the future. Is that okay? Is this what Veronica wants? Mr. Law, even though you two have broken up, now you know her true background. The man in front of me nodded, his smile still as graceful as ever. I didn't know what he saw in my expression. But in that moment, I only felt like a clown with nowhere to hide. After the breakup, I felt sad and hurt. But until now, I hadn't really hated Veronica, because I always thought that, even if it started off wrong, even if it didn't end gracefully. After three whole years of being together, she should at least know the kind of person I am. I didn't care if she had money, and I definitely wouldn't throw away my dignity and pride just to chase after her wealth. But the man in front of me kept smiling as if he hadn't noticed the changes in my expression and asked again. Mr. Law, can you do that? Chapter 4. The last word was typed. I organized the plan and sent it to the team leader for confirmation. Even though I was already exhausted. I couldn't help but think about what Andrew had said to me before he left this morning. I said, rest assured, since we broke up, I won't contact my ex anymore, whether she's a rich second generation or not, so take these things back, I don't need them. After speaking, I placed those handbags back at Andrew's feet, but he didn't even lower his head. Smiling, he said, just some trinkets, they're not worth much. If Mr. Law doesn't like them, just throw them away. When he said that, he sounded exactly like Veronica, the same nonchalant tone 
as if there was no malice, but it still somehow managed to make the listener feel utterly humiliated. That's why I couldn't help but remember Veronica's birthday. I worked tirelessly, scrimped and saved to buy her a gift, and when I presented those things that seemed cheap to her like a treasure, she must have thought I was ridiculous. A colleague knocked on my desk. I snapped back to reality and asked, What's up? The other person smiled. You haven't checked the group, have you? The manager has been looking for you. She wants you to go to her office. Oh, okay, got it. I quickly pushed aside those chaotic thoughts. After thanking my colleague, I went into the manager's office. The manager found me for the same old issue. The company is going to hold a car exhibition in City C, and the branch there lacks experience. So they need someone from headquarters to oversee the situation. Promotion. Double the salary. The only issue is that even after the project ends, I might have to stay in City C for at least six months. About half a month ago, when the news first came out, the manager had approached me once. I declined back then, using my lack of experience as an excuse, but the manager probably knew that was just an excuse. So she asked me again. This time, I didn't refuse. By the time everything was packed, it was a week later. I left the unused items in my rental, and the luggage I couldn't take. I left with Ryan, planning to have him send it to me once I found a place in City C. The company booked a hotel for me in City C, so I could go straight there after the flight, before I left. Ryan insisted on having a farewell hot pot dinner. We returned to a spot near University A, where we often ate during our school days. When choosing the broth, I habitually selected the clear soup. Ryan looked confused and asked, Wait, when did you stop eating spicy? I was a bit puzzled. I do eat spicy. Then why did you pick clear soup? We both eat spicy. Let's get the 9 grid spicy. Only then did I realize I had accidentally checked the clear soup option. I checked the wrong box, I said, crossing out the check and choosing the 9 grid spicy instead. But in truth, I was just used to it, because Veronica doesn't eat spicy food. When we first got together, we rarely ate hot pot. She found it too noisy, thought the environment in hot pot restaurants was chaotic, and preferred eating at home. But later, out of nowhere, she started asking if I wanted to eat hot pot. At that time, we would get the 9 grid spicy. She would eat it, sweating profusely and relying on ice water to survive. After a meal, she barely ate much but filled her stomach with water. Yet, after leaving the hot pot place, she would still stubbornly say, Thanks to you, I think I can handle spicy food better now. I remember looking at her beautiful side profile under the streetlights, with that childish grin, and feeling inexplicably soft inside. After that, we only ever ordered the clear soup. By the time I snapped back to reality, Ryan had already grabbed the menu and quickly ordered the side dishes. Asking if I wanted to add more meat, I shook my head, saying, No need, you decide. Don't save money on me, Cameron, or the next meal will be on you, and I plan to bankrupt you. Then let's go for a buffet next time. Get lost. We joked and laughed. The conversation wandered from north to south, but we both tacitly avoided the real reason for my departure. No work tomorrow. We both drank. My face was only slightly flushed, and I felt a bit lightheaded while walking. But Ryan was completely drunk, singing Lonely Warrior off key and cracking his voice right into my ear. I held onto him with one hand, while using the other to pull out my phone to pay. In a moment of carelessness, this guy ran off just as I was scanning the QR code. After finally settling the bill, I found him leaning against a table near the counter, talking to another customer. Miss, you look like a heartbreaker, he said. I felt my head pound. I rushed over, pulled him up, and quickly apologized to the group he had disturbed. But suddenly someone called my name. Cameron, what a coincidence. Only then did I notice that one of the people sitting at the table was Cecilia. I froze, and a bad feeling crept up. If Cecilia was there, then could it be? I turned stiffly, and sure enough, sitting right by the table's edge was Veronica. Ryan, still stubbornly pointing at her, said, Young lady, you really are quite the heartbreaker, in my opinion, to make amends to all the people you've wronged, you should shave your head and become a nun, yet Veronica, being pointed at, didn't react at all, she simply stared at me with an unwavering gaze, the four people at the table had fallen completely silent, none daring to say a word, I felt the hair on my neck prickle with embarrassment, deeply regretting letting Ryan have that last bottle of beer, after finally managing to control him and lead him out the door. He still wasn't behaving, struggling against me. Don't stop me, I'm reading people's fortunes. Chapter 5 By the time I dragged Ryan out of the hot pot restaurant and squatted by the door, I was already drenched in sweat. While I was using my phone to call a cab, I said to Ryan, Come on, give it a rest, will you? But he looked at me for a moment, then suddenly sniffed, Cameron, you ditched your bro for a woman, do you even count as a friend anymore? This drunk fool's eyes started to redden, and he began sobbing grabbing onto my sleeve and crying his heart out. 
Two men pulling at each other, it was definitely weird. People passing by were all looking our way. But I knew Ryan truly saw me as family. And for a moment, I felt a lump in my throat. I wanted to grab some tissues to wipe his tears, but I couldn't find any in my pockets. Use this. A familiar voice spoke from behind me. The hand stretched out in front of me was fair and slender, holding a beautiful handkerchief. I didn't take it. Instead, I used my sleeve to wipe Ryan's face dry. The person withdrew the hand, speaking calmly. Did you block me? I still didn't respond. Finished booking the ride, and then helped Ryan to the roadside to wait. But she caught up and grabbed my sleeve. I yanked her hand away forcefully, feeling a spark of anger rise within me. Veronica, what the hell is wrong with you? You were the one who said you were done playing, the one who told me to stay away, and now you're coming back out of nowhere. What do you want? After I shook her off, her brows furrowed, but she only said three words, I'm sorry, but to me, it just seemed laughable. Veronica, don't you think this apology is a little late? She saw me laughing and frowned, if you're upset, just yell at me. Don't act like this. No, I was upset, but now I really don't care anymore. Three years, even if you raise a cat or a dog, you'll have some feelings, but you, you're not worth it. You really aren't. So now, I just feel relieved. The sooner we broke up, the better. My phone vibrated, it was the driver calling. I spotted the cab parked on the side of the road, turned off the screen, and said, I'm leaving. Let's hope we never see each other again. When I got home, I received a friend request. No profile picture. No message. Just three words, I'm sorry. I easily guessed who it was from. I ignored it. But to my surprise, she was persistent. She tried several different accounts with messages ranging from, hey handsome, let's get to know each other to looking for business partners, and even I'm your boss, new number, add me, finally, realizing I wouldn't fall for it, she gave up and wrote, I'm sorry, big brother, I really know I was wrong, can't you give me a chance to explain, I found it amusing and only replied to the last one, explain what, explain that you're a liar or that you were two timing me, you want a peaceful breakup and then invite me to your wedding with Andrew, this time, she finally fell silent, Arriving in City C, the branch company had arranged someone to pick me up. The person holding a sign with my name had long hair and an elegant, striking appearance. She stood out amidst the group of young girls clearly sent for pickups, making her seem a bit out of place. Hello, Cameron Law. She extended a hand. I'm Abigail, the manager of the planning department in City C, and my new boss was named Abigail. So when I heard the name, I paused for a moment. I thought you'd send an assistant to pick me up. Abigail explained. My assistant's on leave, her cat's about to have kittens, taking leave for a cat giving birth, is the work atmosphere at the branch that relaxed. Abigail smiled as she led the way, yeah, it's laid back enough to slack off, you won't regret coming here, she made me laugh, a humorous and witty new boss, a good sign, the anxiety of moving to a new city was somewhat eased, on the way to the hotel, Abigail briefly introduced the branch company situation and the work I'd be handling, there was quite a bit of work, but it seemed manageable, however. Since I was new here and unfamiliar with my colleagues, there would definitely be some adjustments in teamwork. We arrived at the hotel, and I checked in. My original plan was to settle into work first and then find a place to rent on a weekend. But during the drive, Abigail told me that because of a large exhibition, we would be very busy for a while. I had arrived a few days early, and wasn't supposed to report to the company until the following Monday. So it seemed like a good idea to find a place before then. I had just contacted a realtor and was about to head out when I received a message from Ryan. Cameron. Veronica came to see me. She's asking if you've moved and where you are now. I frowned. I thought my response yesterday had been clear enough. I really couldn't understand what the point was of her pestering me like this. Is it pride? Because I didn't care. She felt like her charm had been overlooked. Chapter 6. I directly sent Ryan a voice message. Firmly saying. No matter what she asks you. Don't tell her anything. Got it. I haven't said a word, but she was pretty drunk and even cried a bit. She said that at first, she got close to you because of Cecilia, but after being with you, she really did fall for you. She wanted to find the right moment to explain everything and reveal her true identity, but she was afraid of hurting you. That's why she kept putting it off, not expecting you to see that video first. She said a lot, but I can't remember it all. Maybe you should hear her out. No need. There's nothing to explain. Back then. I understood that she had a tough time with her graduate studies. To help her focus on her studies and avoid part-time jobs, I worked hard to make money, even to the point of being hospitalized from exhaustion. She knew everything but lied to me for three years without saying a word. I was halfway through typing this message when I lost my train of thought. In truth, over these three years, Veronica never actively asked me for anything. Working, earning money, and striving for our future were all choices I made on my own. She didn't demand it, didn't see it, and of course, didn't know. 
As for her claim that she initially approached me with a motive but later genuinely fell for me, I don't doubt that either, because motives can be faked, words can deceive, but people's subconscious reactions and expressions can't be staged. Countless times, when I was busy with work and left her on her own, I could clearly see the disappointment and loneliness on her face turn into brightness and joy the moment I finally came back to her. When my phone died on my way home from work and I couldn't be reached, she ran out in her slippers, searching for me for two whole hours, only to find out that I had already returned home. Her first reaction was to hug me with teary eyes, not to blame me. She was a simple girl, with clear distinctions between love and hate. When protecting the one she loved conflicted with seeking revenge for her good friend, she may have struggled with anxiety. She was likely torn between revealing the truth and facing the problem, or delaying things to avoid the conflict. In the end, when everything came to light, I became the one left behind. People often say that love between men and women is a game. Either the east wind overpowers the west, or the west wind overpowers the east. But I don't quite agree with that. I believe a good relationship should be built on equality. But because of Veronica's deception, this relationship was unequal from the very beginning. Perhaps she had her reasons. Behind those actions that hurt me deeply, there might have been circumstances beyond her control. But none of that matters to me anymore because we were never from the same world. We only briefly fell in love because of a lie. And once the truth was revealed, we had to return to our own realities. So from the moment the lie was exposed, it was already over between us. Thinking about all this, and looking again at the words I had just typed, I suddenly felt tired. Once you've made up your mind to let go of something or someone, there's no point in rehashing old memories or accusations. I took a deep breath, deleted everything, and replaced it with one sentence. Veronica is getting engaged to Andrew. Her affairs have nothing to do with me. As expected, the person on the other side blew up. What the hell? She's getting engaged and still bothering you. Is she crazy? She was acting all sincere today. Not fighting back when I was pissed and pretending to be all regretful. I almost believed she really knew she was wrong. Just proves it. Good looking people are always trouble. But Cameron, what are you going to do? Expose her. Maybe. I can't swallow this. Once the other person calmed down a bit, I finally said. No need. Since we've broken up, there's no point in dragging this on. Just ignore her. All right. Got it. I promise to keep my mouth shut from now on and won't give her another chance to bother you. Chapter 7. By the way, how are things over there? Is it hot in the south? Is it very different from here? How's the company? Are your colleagues easy to get along with? It was early May, and the north was still transitioning between spring and summer, with sunny days occasionally interrupted by a few rainy ones. Jackets and t-shirts were both in play with neither daring to be stored away just yet. But in City C, located in the south, summer had already arrived. I glanced out the hotel window. The same tall buildings. People hurrying along the streets, it didn't seem much different from Beijing. I replied on the phone. It's a bit hot, but still bearable. I arrived early, so I haven't checked in with the company yet. The department manager personally picked me up from the airport. She seems pretty nice. Ryan immediately sounded wary, asking nervously. Why would a manager do something like picking you up from the airport? Is it a guy or a woman? Don't tell me it's a middle-aged woman who heard you're handsome and wants to take advantage of you. I laughed. Don't be ridiculous. The branch has a younger staff structure. The manager isn't much older than me. She only came because her assistant took a leave of absence. And they couldn't find anyone else to cover. That young and already a manager. Impressive. Is she pretty? She's pretty attractive. Ryan's question made me instinctively recall. Judging by her face alone. Abigail wasn't exactly the cute type. But at the airport. Standing in the middle of a crowd holding a sign, she definitely drew quite a few heads turning her way. I remembered seeing a debate online about whether cuteness or sexiness was more important. The responses were varied, with plenty of heated arguments. But there was one short comment that stood out and dominated the discussion. It said, a true goddess doesn't lack either cuteness or sexiness. Abigail was a perfect example of that statement. Her features were delicate, with a sharp nose and a perfectly proportioned figure. Even with the most basic long black hair and work attire. She still caught people's attention walking down the street, perhaps afraid that I was feeling down. Ryan kept up a stream of small talk, dragging the conversation out, not wanting to hang up. It was I who eventually suggested he hurry off to work. He finally hung up, though not before reminding me that if I felt bad, I should call him and not bottle it up. I laughed and teased. Got it. Don't act like an old grandma. After hanging up, I felt warm inside. Since I had an apartment viewing in the afternoon, I grabbed my bag and headed out to find lunch. During the meal, I added the rental agent's contact details. This agent was actually recommended to me by Abigail when she heard I was looking for a place. They were incredibly efficient. After I sent over my requirements, they quickly matched me with six or seven options and arranged for me to view them in the afternoon. I wanted to rent near the company for convenience, 
but without exception. Every option was expensive. A 20 square meter studio cost 1,900 yuan. Excluding utilities, the kitchen was next to the bathroom, with the washing machine crammed beside the stove. After viewing several places, the best fit was a shared apartment with a rented secondary bedroom. It was 60 square meters, a bit farther from the company, but only a kilometer away, within walking distance. The master bedroom had already been rented out, and the secondary bedroom was 18 square meters with a small attached bathroom. The kitchen and living room were shared spaces, with a rent of 1,500 yuan. The best part was that the apartment was clean and well kept, with excellent lighting. I was sold on it immediately. The only issue, the other tenant was said to be a woman. Sharing an apartment with a woman sounded both ambiguous and exciting, but looking at it from a realistic, non-romantic perspective, it mostly just seemed like a hassle. The agent kept persuading me. He said the apartment had just been listed, was great value for the price, and would be rented out soon. Plus, the other tenant was a great person, definitely not the troublesome type. She only moved because her previous roommate had switched jobs, leaving the secondary bedroom vacant. And since the apartment suited me so well, after some hesitation, I decided to trust the agent's advice. I waited for the other tenant to get off work, curious to meet them. Finally, the agent received word that the other tenant had returned, and when the door opened, Abigail walked in with her bag. Ah, now I understood why Abigail had just so conveniently saved the agent's contact info. Chapter 8 Your roommate's looking for someone to share an apartment, was that you? Abigail sighed. Yes, it was. Are you also looking to live near the office? That's right, the agent, caught between us looked at me and then at her, finally asking in confusion, you two know each other, what a coincidence, we both smiled bitterly, it was quite the coincidence, but even so, in the end, I didn't choose to share an apartment with Abigail, after all, co-renting with someone of the opposite sex was already ambiguous enough, adding the fact that we were colleagues at the company made it even more awkward, I believed Abigail felt the same, after saying goodbye to the agent, I took a cab back to the hotel, I planned to take another day tomorrow to check out a few other apartments the agent had recommended, but what I didn't expect was for Veronica to show up. The hotel I was staying at was booked by the company, and not even Ryan knew the exact location. So when I saw Veronica lounging on the sofa in the lobby, casually playing on her phone and attracting stares from everyone with her beauty, I froze. Did she come here on purpose, or was this just a coincidence? But either way, I really didn't want to have any more contact with her. So I raised my arm to cover my face and tried to quickly slip through the lobby. But unexpectedly, I bumped into someone. It was a middle-aged man, slightly overweight and reeking of alcohol. He was leaning against the counter, lighting a cigarette. When I collided with him, the lit lighter ended up right on his head, burning off a lock of his hair. The man, clearly a bit slow from the drink, raised his eyes to look at his own hair, even meeting my gaze. It wasn't until the smell of burning hair filled the air that he realized what had happened, frantically putting out the fire on his head. He smashed the lighter to the ground. You damn idiot. Are you blind or what? I'm sorry. I didn't see you. Don't give me that crap. I'm standing right here. How could you not see me? The shout drew the attention of the entire lobby. Of course. That included Veronica. I'm not good at dealing with drunk people. Especially ones who look disturbingly like the person in my nightmares, a middle-aged man. My palms started sweating. And I wanted to run but couldn't. So I just kept apologizing. Until someone stepped in. Blocking the man's insults with her body. Are you really going to let him talk to you like that? I looked up and met Veronica's gaze. Filled with a mix of concern and frustration. Even if you want to avoid me. At least hear me out first. Before I could respond. The drunk man exploded again. Who the hell are you? You little tramp. Mind your own business. Do you want to die? Can't you just quiet down? You want compensation. Is this enough? Veronica's eyes were sharp as she unfastened the watch from her wrist and tossed it into the man's arms. The watch worth over a million, immediately silenced him, but I couldn't let her keep doing this, we had already broken up, and there shouldn't be any more ties between us, so I forced myself to suppress my feelings, stepped around her, and approached the man, sorry, I don't know her, please give the watch back, whatever compensation you want for your hair, I'll pay, I didn't have any cash on me, so I pulled up my WeChat QR code, showing him that I would pay, Veronica frowned, and the emotion in her eyes deepened, Cameron, what are you doing? You're really that desperate to cut ties with me? Veronica, we've already broken up, but I don't want to break up with you. There are things I can't tell you right now, but I promise I won't marry Andrew. Just give me a little more time. Okay, I'm about to call off the engagement. It's not necessary. Cameron, please don't do this. The drunk man's friend, noticing the argument between us, finally realized something was off. He walked over and pulled the man away. But by now, we had drawn an audience, with plenty of people watching the drama unfold. I turned to leave, 
but someone grabbed my arm. Can't you give me one more chance? I know I lied to you, but I came here to apologize. I know I was wrong. Can't you forgive me just this once? Three years of feelings, and you can just let go like that. Is your heart really made of stone? Her eyes were red, and she stared at me intensely, not caring about the stares from others. This was the first time she had lost control since our breakup. There were so many things I wanted to say, but in the end, I didn't explain anything. I just pried her fingers off my arm one by one. After putting some distance between us, I said, Veronica, we're from different worlds. I turned and got into the elevator, never looking back the whole way, so I didn't know how she reacted to those words. Only when I returned to my hotel room did I receive a message from an unknown number. It was only four words, but I can't let go. What she couldn't let go of, she didn't say. I stared at the message for a while, then deleted it. Chapter 9 I officially started at the company three days later. I was a little nervous, worrying about how I would fit in with my new colleagues when we first met. But to my surprise, after completing the onboarding process and being led to the office by HR, I found it completely empty. Where is everyone? At this time, they should be in the office. HR was puzzled too, clearly not expecting this situation. She quickly dialed Abigail's number. Then she told me. Manager he is in a meeting with the editor-in-chief, and the rest of the team is at the exhibition. You can wait here for a bit, and when manager he returns. She'll take you there. I nodded in understanding. On-site events are always the most troublesome, especially large ones like car shows, with lots of tasks to handle. It's normal for the whole department to be on-site. I found my desk and sat down. I started organizing my things while waiting. But less than five minutes had passed when someone suddenly burst in. Boss, there's trouble at the site. You need to come help, or else Eva will. It was a tall, skinny guy wearing glasses with very pale skin. He stopped mid-sentence when he saw only me in the office. Standing there frozen. Um, who are you? My name's Cameron. I'm new here. Oh, I know you. You're the big shot transferred from headquarters. I'm Jack. Wow, you're really handsome. Cameron, actually, I was supposed to pick you up from the airport the other day, but my cat had kittens, and I couldn't leave. Oh, do you like cats? Jack, without hesitation, sat down next to me, but the next second, he jumped back up. Wait, no, I can't sit down. I need to find the boss and get to the site. There's a problem. Cameron. Do you know where the boss went? The boss is our manager. Sister he. I don't know where she is. But HR said she's in a meeting with the editor-in-chief. Then we're doomed. Jack groaned. Visibly frustrated. It must be editor who. She's the hardest to deal with. Talks a lot. Has a bad temper. Whenever the boss has a meeting with her. It lasts at least a whole morning. And she can't be interrupted. What do we do now? Seeing him like this. I couldn't help but ask. What exactly happened at the site? Jack explained. And I finally understood the situation. One of the young planners in the office had gotten into an argument with the workers on site. The issue started because the workers misread the blueprints and swapped the advertisements for two car brands, so they needed to be removed and reinstalled. However, the workers thought that since the two exhibition areas were the same size, there was no need to redo the installation. But in reality, while the two areas were the same size, their proximity to the entrance was different, and the exhibition fees paid by the brands were based on that. During the discussion, Things escalated from a disagreement to a full-blown argument. Now the workers were leading a strike, but the event's progress couldn't be delayed. I thought for a moment and then said to Jack, Why don't I go with you to the site? I've encountered similar situations before. Maybe I can help. Really? Jack's eyes lit up, and he thanked me profusely. The exhibition hall wasn't too far from the office building, but it wasn't exactly close either. We took the subway for 20 minutes and then walked several hundred meters. By the time we got there, we saw the workers sitting on the ground refusing to work, in a deadlock, a young man in a shirt, holding a fan, was squatting by the door with a worried look on his face, I guess that this must be the colleague Jack had mentioned, Eva, the venue was spacious, and Jack and I naturally caught people's attention as we walked in, but the lead worker who had organized the strike just glanced at us and warned, it doesn't matter how many of you come today, we're not putting up with this anymore, just settle the pay from the past few days, and we're leaving, hearing this, Eva jumped to her feet, her face full of anger, ready to argue again. I quickly gave Jack a look, signaling him to stop her. Then I stepped forward and stood in front of the lead worker. Uncle, when did you arrive in Sea City? Why didn't you let me know? The worker was stunned, clearly not expecting me to say that. Young man, don't call me that. I don't know you. You don't know me. I'm Cameron. Didn't we just meet at my cousin's wedding two years ago back home? The worker still frowned but sounded less harsh than before. You must be mistaken. Kid, I really don't know you. Is that so? Sorry about that. Uncle, I must have gotten it wrong. You look a lot like my second uncle. Plus, being away from home has made me a bit homesick. It's fine. 
No need to apologize. The worker's expression softened, and he waved his hand. I then spoke up. So, uncle, I'm the new person in charge. My colleagues mentioned you didn't want to continue the job. May I ask what happened? You're asking me what happened. The worker's expression soured again. It's your colleague who said the job had to be done in a week. Tomorrow's the last day. And now we're being told to undo what's already been done and start over. How are we supposed to finish on time? Dragging things out in the middle of the day. Not letting us take a break. We're human. You know. We need rest to keep working. His tone was sharp. But at least he wasn't refusing to talk. Sensing where the issue lay. I relaxed a little. I see. Well. That's definitely not right. It's not even about the job. If you don't rest properly at noon. How can you have the energy to keep working? Seeing that I agreed with him, the worker's expression softened again, and he said, Exactly, young man, we're not against doing the work, it's just that everyone's hungry and can't keep going. I thought for a moment and then said, How about this, we'll order lunch for you, and after you've eaten and had a half hour break, could you replace the signs then? The worker's eyes lit up, he exchanged glances with the others behind him and nodded without much hesitation. That, sounds reasonable, problem solved. Jack quickly made a call to order lunch for everyone. As we waited at the entrance for the delivery, he looked at me, excitement on his face. Cameron, you're amazing. How did you do that? We've been trying to talk to them for ages, and nothing worked. But as soon as you stepped in, they agreed. I smiled and explained. It's not hard to communicate. You just have to understand each other. The car show was held in a prime location at the exhibition center, surrounded by tall buildings, malls, and entertainment venues, bright and bustling. But to these workers, this place was unfamiliar. The high rent had driven away most of the street vendors. They didn't understand how to use food delivery apps. And after a busy morning, they had to walk far to find a place to eat. So when they refused to work through lunch, it wasn't because they didn't want to, it was because they couldn't. If their break time was shortened, they wouldn't be able to find anywhere nearby to eat. And they'd go hungry. Jack looked puzzled. But Cameron, if they had trouble finding food, why didn't they just say so? Ordering takeout isn't a big deal because they care too much, they work hard selling their labor, without much education, and they aren't young anymore. In this fast-paced world that's always rushing toward something newer and better, they feel left behind, they haven't done anything wrong, yet they constantly feel out of place because they can't keep up. People are like that, the more they care, the more sensitive they become. What looks like stubbornness often comes from insecurity, not strength. I had just finished speaking when someone behind me spoke instead of Jack, but sometimes, the things or people that make us feel insecure are exactly what we need to let go of. I turned around to see Abigail walking over from the exhibition hall. She walked with purpose, clearly just arriving herself. Chapter 10 The welcome dinner that evening was held at a restaurant near the company. Abigail treated us all, taking us to a Chongqing hotpot place. Because of the earlier incident that day, I had already met most of my colleagues. Aside from Jack, whom I'd already met, there was Eva from Operations, a video editor named Chan and Wu from copywriting, since we were all around the same age. It was easier to get along than I had imagined. After a few rounds of drinks, the atmosphere at the table became quite lively. Eva stood up to toast, her expression playful, a big thank you to our superhero Cameron for saving me, and if I'd known that the big shot from HQ was such a handsome guy, I would have definitely gone to the airport to pick you up myself. Jack laughed, Cameron, don't listen to her, Eva's a lady player, she falls for any handsome guy she sees. Eva wasn't upset at being exposed and cheerfully retorted. Oh, please. What about MS? He. She hid the resume from us and went to the airport herself to pick up the handsome guy. Now that is being shameless. You're full of it. The boss only went because I was on leave and there was no one else to send. Don't compare me to you. How is it any different? You're just as guilty of being shameless. You just can't stand that the boss is prettier than me. Everyone burst into laughter, teasing each other, clearly showing they were on good terms. Jack was a tough competitor and soon Eva was out of comebacks. Half-jokingly, she turned to Abigail for help. Boss, tell the truth, did you go to pick him up because you saw his resume? Hearing this, the others also joined in, egging her on. I looked up, only to lock eyes with Abigail, who was sitting across from me, but she merely smiled and didn't bother to explain. Chapter 11 With the exhibitions opening just around the corner, both the online marketing campaign and offline brand coordination had reached critical stages. For the promotional video, Abigail and the editor, Chan, spent their days either filming material on-site or back at the office editing, running between two places. I led the rest of the team on-site. Problems popped up in the most unexpected places and in the most unimaginable ways. Everyone was too busy to even touch the ground. That welcome dinner ended up being the only time we had all gathered together in the past two weeks. Plus, as mid-month passed, 
The heat in City C grew even more unbearable. The sticky, humid heat felt like a net suffocating everyone's temper. Even though the project was progressing smoothly, and we could have gone out for lunch, everyone preferred staying in the break room with the air conditioning and ordering delivery instead, while we waited for the food. Jack sat next to me, looking at his phone for a while. Suddenly, he cried out excitedly, You guys, look at this, my goddess is engaged. He held his phone up in front of me. I looked at the screen and saw the trending topic, hashtag Andrew engaged to Miss Pete group. I froze for a moment, speechless, Jack, thinking I didn't know who they were, happily explained, Cameron, don't you know these two? Haven't you been following the trending topics lately? They're such a great couple. The woman is a rich heiress, but she's had a crush on Andrew since she was young. She chased after him for years, but he always saw her as a little sister. Finally, out of frustration, she left her family, worked her way through university, even got a degree from University A, and started her own company. Then she came back, more stunning than ever, and supported him at a big event. Andrew finally fell in love with her, and now they're engaged. Isn't it sweet? It's true love. So, their story, looked like that to others. I didn't know what to say, so I just smiled awkwardly, pretending I wasn't interested in such things. But it was Eva, who had just opened a bottle of water, who responded, You're so naive, Jack. What sweet love. It's all fake. Only a fool like you would believe in true love in the entertainment industry. My friend works in PR, and she told me the truth. These two aren't what they seem. That whole trending topic was a publicity stunt. Andrew staged the whole thing to promote his company. The girl didn't even want to get engaged, but she was forced into it by her family's influence. Jack glared at her. You're talking nonsense. Pfft. It's all true. You just don't want to believe it. They kept bickering back and forth, but no matter how the conversation went, they couldn't avoid mentioning that person. I only felt more stifled in the break room. I stood up, wanting to go outside for some fresh air, but just as I did, I bumped into Abigail, who was carrying coffee into the break room. She saw me and handed me a cup, then smiled and asked, Have you eaten yet? I shook my head, the delivery hasn't arrived, why didn't you go out for lunch? It's too hot outside, didn't feel like moving, then why not stay inside with the AC and wait? It felt too stuffy inside, it was such a poor excuse that even I felt guilty. But Abigail didn't call me out on it. She left the coffee by the door, calling to the others inside to come and get it. Then she smiled at me and said, Well, I feel the same way. Why don't we hang out for a bit? I had wanted to be alone and not deal with any socializing. But since she was being kind, I couldn't bring myself to refuse. The iced Americano was a bit bitter. And with an empty stomach, I didn't dare drink much. I muttered something under my breath. Abigail heard me and, to my surprise, pulled out a few candies from somewhere and placed them in my hand. The brightly colored wrappers, with their shiny holographic packaging, reminded me of old-fashioned candies, but all the ones in my hand were red, which happened to be my favorite color. But how did Abigail know? Meeting my confused gaze, Abigail suddenly laughed, though there was a hint of helplessness in her eyes. You little liar. You've completely forgotten about me, haven't you? If I'd known you'd forget so easily, I wouldn't have bothered paying you back for those candies. Chapter 12 The familiar tone and way of addressing me finally jogged my memory. You're that little kid who was being bullied. When I was eight years old, I stayed at my uncle's house. That year, my parents divorced and each started new families. Feeling sorry that I had no one to take care of me, my uncle took me in. My uncle and aunt were the kindest people in the world, and they took very good care of me. But no matter how good they were, there was always a thin veil of separation. My cousin would get scolded when he did something wrong, run away from home, and get reprimanded by his parents for wanting a new phone. But even with all that, he never lacked the things he wanted, and I was always envious. Whenever I missed my parents too much, I would skip school. I would sneak through the broken fence at school and wander the streets. It was during one of those afternoons when I met the little kid. She was crouching alone in a corner, wearing a delicate little dress but curled up in a ball, surrounded by a few fierce-looking stray dogs. I was scared too, but in the end, I picked up a stick and ran at the dogs. Stray dogs are cowards when faced with a show of strength, so they ran off. I hurried to help her up and asked if she was okay. She said she was fine, just too hungry to outrun the dogs. She looked so pitiful, her stomach growling loudly. After thinking it over, I gave her half of the candy I had saved up for a long time. Her eyes lit up, and after gobbling it down, she swore to me that she would repay me and buy me even more candy. Before we parted, she asked where I lived and what my name was. I told her my name, but when it came to my address, I hesitated. My uncle and aunt didn't know I was skipping school let alone that I had made a new friend. If she came to deliver candy, I'd be in trouble. So I lied, saying I lived right by the school, in the tallest house. After all, I went to school every day, so we'd see each other again. 
We became friends after that. She would tell me about her parents fighting, her deskmates new games, and I would tell her how much I missed home, encouraging her to study hard and ignore the gossip of others. But later, my uncle had to move for work, and I had to transfer schools. I never thought our next meeting would happen like this. I was surprised and a bit amused. So I asked, how did you recognize me? Wait, after all this time, how do you even remember me? Abigail looked conflicted as she began to explain. Do you remember I said I would repay you? Well, after that day, I started saving up money. I broke open every piggy bank I had and went to all the nearby supermarkets and stores to buy candy for you. But when I was about to give you the candy, I realized you had given me a fake address. So every day at school, I emptied my books and carried a bag full of candy around trying to find you. But then a teacher caught me, told my mom, and I got a serious beating. All the candy was thrown away. I cried for days. How could I possibly forget that? I hadn't expected our encounter back then to have such an aftermath. I felt a bit guilty, trying to stifle my laughter as I apologized. Sorry, I moved away after that. No way, the trauma you caused me is too big. I can't forgive you so easily. All right then, go ahead and call the cops. Abigail was taken aback by my sudden response and then burst out laughing. Her smile was bright and cheerful, and the gloom that had been weighing on my heart for days seemed to lift a little. Chapter 13 Carrying the Takeout Back to the Break Room I didn't expect the previously tense atmosphere to have completely changed. Just moments ago, Jack and Eva were at each other's throats, but now they were huddled together, intently staring at a phone screen. This must be a PR crisis, right? Oh no, the page crashed. It won't load. Try exiting and reloading. They were so focused that when Abigail and I walked in, they barely glanced up to greet us. Abigail asked, What's going on? You two seem really serious. Eva frantically refreshed the page several times to no avail before finally looking up to explain. Something big just happened. Come check out the drama. Earlier, Andrew announced his engagement, and all the social media accounts were praising him. But now someone's leaked footage that a fight broke out at the engagement. I frowned and instinctively asked, What do you mean? No one knows exactly what happened, but a paparazzo snuck in and recorded the engagement turning into chaos. Apparently, the bride didn't even know about the engagement, it was all a setup. When she found out, she went ballistic, and then her sister threw the first punch. The video that was leaked was blurry. Since it was filmed from a distance, there was no audio either. But Andrew is a celebrity, so he's instantly recognizable. Plus, with his expensive suit and flawless hair, he easily stole the spotlight in the footage. The video started with Veronica walking into the venue. The event looked lavish, with everyone dressed in suits and gowns. So when Veronica entered wearing casual clothes, she immediately drew most of the attention. Andrew walked toward her, but she stepped aside to avoid him. Then, with a frustrated expression, she seemed to be angrily questioning him about something. But the conversation didn't go well, and Veronica's face turned cold as she flipped over the engagement sign that had a photo of her and Andrew. Moments later, Cecilia rushed out and grabbed Veronica by the hair. The scene descended into chaos, security closed in, the person filming was spotted, and the video cut off abruptly. Jack sighed, what a disaster. My favorite couple lasted less than an hour before it was all over, and now people are saying Veronica already had a boyfriend. She met him during her graduate studies at a university, and they were even living together. Everyone says the guy is a freeloader, but now she's causing a scene at the engagement because of him. Sigh, how could my goddess be so foolish? What do you mean, because of him? Eva jumped in. Jack. You're too naive. Rich girls like her play around a lot. No way she's only had one boyfriend. I bet she's just a typical player who didn't want to settle down. No deep reason behind it. Right. Sister he. Cameron. Don't you think? Abigail responded. We can't judge without knowing the full story. And I didn't want to join in the conversation. So I just shook my head. Chapter 14. After getting home from work. I should have started unpacking my room. But seeing all the large unopened boxes Ryan had sent me scattered across the floor made me feel lazy. I had already taken out the essentials, so maybe I could unpack the rest later, or so I thought. With that in mind, I decided to ignore them for now. I went to take a shower first, wrapped in a towel when I came out. I noticed several missed calls on my phone. The number was unknown, but the location was marked as being from City C. Maybe it was the delivery service. Thinking that, I called back. To my surprise, it was the hotel where I had previously stayed. The front desk said that someone had mistakenly sent a package to the hotel for me but they couldn't reach the sender. So, they were asking for my current address to send it over for me to handle. Who would have sent me something? And why to the hotel? Could Ryan have made a mistake? Although I wasn't sure what the package was. I didn't want to trouble the hotel staff. So I gave them my current address and contact information, asking them to send it over and call me when it arrived. After hanging up, I asked Ryan if she had sent anything to the hotel. She denied it, 
I was left confused. So, I messaged Abigail to check if the company had accidentally sent any documents to the wrong address. Since the company had booked the hotel when I first arrived in City C, but Abigail had no idea what was going on either. All I could do was wait. Finally, after half an hour, I heard a knock at the door. Without thinking, I opened it immediately, only to find Veronica standing outside. She was dressed in all black, wearing a baseball cap, and holding a large suitcase. Her bangs were pushed down by the cap, partially covering her eyes. Standing in the shadow of the hallway, I could just make out her slightly red lips. I couldn't help but think of the video where Cecilia had grabbed her by the hair. Frowning, I asked, why is it you? Did you bribe the hotel to give you my address? But she shook her head, no, they wouldn't tell me. So, I sent a package to the hotel and had the courier drop it off and leave. I figured they'd call you to deal with it. And when they called for a runner, I eavesdropped on the address. Her roundabout method was so extreme that, for a moment, I didn't know whether to report her for harassment or to be impressed by her resourcefulness. But just as I was about to figure out how to send her away, she suddenly closed her eyes and collapsed straight into my arms. Startled, I instinctively caught her, and her cap fell off. Under the light from inside the house, I finally noticed that her face was unnaturally red, and her wrist, which I had briefly touched, was burning hot. She had a fever. She lay on the carpet, still trying to get up. It seemed the high fever had caused her eyes to glaze over, tears brimming in the corners. As she hoarsely muttered something under her breath, I leaned closer to hear, and she was saying, I'm sorry, it was my fault. And just when I didn't know what to do with her, there was a sudden rush of footsteps in the hallway. Then Abigail appeared breathlessly at the door. Cameron, are you okay? You didn't answer your phone, and I heard there have been some delivery scams lately, from the wide open door. Abigail first glanced at the unconscious Veronica lying on the floor, then at me crouching beside her. Only then, with a slightly confused tone, did she ask, what is going on here? Chapter 15 I quickly explained that I had just left my phone charging in the bedroom, which was why I missed the call, and I hadn't encountered any delivery scam. Did I make you come all this way for nothing? Abigail shook her head. No, it was me being overly cautious, overthinking things. After helping me lift Veronica from the floor onto the couch, Abigail said her goodbyes. If everything's fine here, I'll head out. I followed her to the door, but after she turned to leave, she paused and asked, Can I ask, who is she to you? She was clearly referring to Veronica, but having an ex suddenly show up was a little strange. I didn't want my personal affairs becoming office gossip, so I lied. She's my cousin's younger sister. She had a fight with her parents and ran away from home. Abigail glanced at the suitcase by the door, seeming relieved, and smiled. Teenagers, right, always running away from home at the slightest thing. I nodded, going along with her. After sending Abigail off and closing the door, I noticed that the person on the couch had woken up without me realizing it. She was staring at me intently. Cameron, who's your sister? Her voice was hoarse from the fever, and though weak, she stubbornly pushed herself up with her arms. And who was that woman? Your new girlfriend. Are you with her just to spite me? Or do you actually like her now? Her breathing was uneven. Her fan-like lashes casting a small shadow over her face. Making her look like an abandoned puppy. I looked away. Avoiding her gaze. Trespassing is illegal. If you leave now. I won't call the police. But she was persistent. Standing up and asking again. Is she really your new girlfriend? Is that why you came to City C? She looked thinner. Her pale face even more fragile. I stepped back. Clearing the doorway. Yes, I really like her. So what you're doing now is seriously interfering with my life. I don't believe you. You're lying. Her eyes were filled with sadness. Her voice trembling slightly. But I smiled. The corners of my lips curling as I looked at her. Why would I lie? Veronica, do you really think you're that important? Someone like you. I hear it costs at least 5,000 a month to keep a girl like you around. After three years of freeloading, I at least had to be a little nice to you. Or did you misunderstand and actually think I liked you? Her face instantly turned pale, the emotion in her eyes shifted from sadness to disbelief, and finally, to anger, I stood there, watching as she dragged her suitcase out, she didn't even look back as she went down the stairs, only after that did I pick up my phone, cut off the call, and reply to the message, she's gone, she probably won't come back, the response came immediately, I heard everything, thank you, Mr. Law, the video has been destroyed, they even sent over a statement, it said that if the video ever got leaked in the future, they would take full responsibility and pay a huge compensation. I didn't look at it. I just deleted the conversation. Afterward, I squatted on the floor, my hands cold, and covered my face. I had received that message while I was on the way. It was Andrew who contacted me. He sent me a video, a video I thought I'd never have to see again in my life. It captured the most humiliating, 
Unforgettable part of my past. Back when I was in university, my first job was working as a receptionist at a KTV. One night, a man, drunk, asked me to guide him to the restroom. I was young and inexperienced back then. I really thought he just needed directions. But when we turned the corner into the hallway, he suddenly leaned in and started groping me. That was the first time I realized that some men even go after the same gender. I froze for a moment before I snapped out of it, struggling like crazy and yelling that I would call the police. It wasn't until then that he sobered up, cursing me as he did. Fuck off. Stop pretending. Afraid I would call the cops. He pulled out 5,000 yuan and threw it at me, telling me to keep my mouth shut. 5,000 yuan. Just enough to cover a year's tuition. It could let me quit that KTV job and stop working late nights. It could buy me some peace for at least a year. Without having to scramble for tuition. Without needing to work so many part-time jobs. It could give me time to study and aim for a scholarship. And find a more decent part-time job during my free time. I took the money. On my way back to school. I kept trying to convince myself. Saying. It's fine. I'm a guy. It doesn't matter. 5,000 yuan is a lot. It's like a blessing in disguise. I'll never go back to that place. And I'll never see that person again. But even so. When I got back to the dorm that night. I still showered over and over. And for a long time after that, every time I saw a fat, middle-aged men with glasses, I felt physically sick. Chapter 16. Knock knock knock. Someone was knocking on the door. I snapped out of my thoughts and called out. Who is it? Delivery. I have something for you. I opened the door to find a delivery guy in uniform holding a large bouquet of bright yellow sunflowers. The flower language of sunflowers symbolizes faith, radiance, pride, loyalty, sunshine, and brightness. It represents silent love. Love that is open and unwavering, brave enough to pursue whatever it desires. Along with the flowers came, a letter, a handwritten apology letter from Veronica, Cameron. This is a letter I wrote a long time ago, but never knew how to give it to you. I'm sorry. I never really wanted to agree to Cecilia's plan to get revenge on you back then. I thought it was childish and foolish, and completely unnecessary to bully an ordinary person like that. So when she first asked, I refused. No matter how many times she tried to convince and beg me. I pretended not to hear, until that night, when we were supposed to meet up, but Cecilia dragged everyone to the coffee shop where you worked part-time, she brought them there to cause trouble, I didn't want to get involved, so I stayed in the car, through the shop's windows, I saw them yelling at you and purposely spilling coffee on you, that was the first time I saw you, I thought you would endure it, like someone used to being bullied, but you didn't, you calmly demanded that she pay. Not only for the laundry and cleaning but also for emotional damages. You even said there was a security camera and you would call the police. Cecilia was stunned by you. And I was surprised too. Surprised that you weren't what I had imagined. At that moment. I finally understood why Cecilia was so determined to target you. I sat in the car. Watching like it was a show. Thoroughly entertained. Until the manager unfairly scolded you and you lost your job. You walked out of that coffee shop with your head held high. Like a proud fighter. But sitting in the car. I knew you were deeply hurt. I rolled down the window, thinking of asking if you were okay, but you walked right past me without looking, muttering under your breath, these jerks, may they never get a seasoning packet with their instant noodles again. You were gritting your teeth in anger, but still refused to give in, it was at that moment I thought, maybe if I pursued you, Cecilia would stop bothering you, and then I agreed to Cecilia's plan, I hid my true identity and got close to you, got to know you, every time I caught you looking at me, my heart would race, the three years we spent together were both the happiest and most painful years of my life, because I loved you, because I lied to you, and the longer it went on, the more painful it became, I even fantasized that if I could drag it out long enough, you and Cecilia would forget about each other, and the lie would unravel on its own, but I was wrong, because lies don't fade with time, they only become harder to explain the longer they're hidden, until it all came to light, and you discovered who I really was, only then did I realize how foolish I had been, but I really do know that I was wrong. Can you forgive me and give me another chance? Sir, could you please sign for this? The reminder brought me back to reality. After signing, I took the bouquet and placed it in the corner. Suddenly, the dim and cramped apartment seemed to be lit by a beam of light. But my vision blurred with tears. That distant brightness now seemed more out of reach than ever. We were never from the same world. She is a favored daughter of fortune. Radiant and dazzling. She wasn't meant to endure humiliation or compromise for someone else. I don't care about that video. That's part of my past. And while it may not have been glamorous, it was the best choice I could make back then to survive. Even if that video were to be leaked today, in my current situation, it wouldn't harm me at all. I'm just an ordinary person. I don't rely on the internet to live. If things got out of hand, maybe the company or my colleagues would gossip, but I could still quit and find another job. 
In the adult world, reputation and others' opinions matter. But true strength lies in your abilities and inner resilience. I'm not afraid of that video being exposed. But Andrew's phone call reminded me once again that Veronica and I were never from the same world. We met at our lowest points, leaning on each other for support. But in the end, we are different. Chapter 17 Earlier today, I received a message from Andrew while I was still on the road. My phone vibrated, indicating a new message had arrived. Mr. Law, there's something I think you should know. Do you have time for a call? It was from an unknown number. I thought it was a scam and ignored it. But then another message came right after. It's about Veronica. I'm Andrew. I didn't know why Andrew was reaching out to me. But I found a quiet place to take the call anyway. He had a lot to say. He talked about how my background wasn't good enough for Veronica. How a marriage between wealthy families was the most stable arrangement. And that even if I insisted on being with Veronica, I'd only ever be the third wheel. But the most important thing he told me was this. Years ago, after I offended Cecilia, her initial plan for revenge wasn't as childish as I thought. Born with a silver spoon and spoiled by her family, she was rich and powerful, always looking down on others. After getting hit and humiliated, she was furious, desperate for revenge. She spent a lot of money just to investigate me. She even made a bold declaration, promising a big reward for anyone who could dig up dirt on me. That's how she got her hands on the surveillance footage from the KTV, showing me taking money from a man. Cecilia was thrilled and planned to upload the video online along with my personal information and academic details on the campus forum of University A. Her pre-written title, Male Student Caught Doing Gay Escort Work for Money, it was more than enough to ruin my life if it went viral. I might even have been expelled. It was Veronica who stopped her, saying that Cecilia shouldn't destroy someone's life over an unintentional mistake. Of course, Cecilia disagreed and immediately refused, but Veronica's warning that if the victim reported her, she could also get into trouble, gave Cecilia some pause. She began to hesitate about whether to release the video. Then, after seeing a girl with a rejected love letter walking away heartbroken after confessing to Veronica, Cecilia came up with another idea. She said, Veronica, why don't you help me get revenge? You could pursue that poor guy, make him fall for you, and then dump him hard. He'll be devastated. I promise, if you help me get revenge, I'll do anything you want in return. Just like Veronica said in her letter. At first, she refused, but as Cecilia kept pressuring me, Veronica couldn't bear it anymore, and so began a ridiculous three-year revenge scheme. As Veronica started developing real feelings, she delayed things. Whenever Cecilia would push her to speed things up, Veronica would say I wasn't in love with her enough yet, that it needed more time. But as the seasons passed, even someone as dense as Cecilia finally realized something was off. That night, it was Veronica's father's birthday. She had no choice but to go home. At the same time, Andrew was attending an event where he was put in a difficult situation. Since Cecilia wasn't a good driver, she begged Veronica to go with her to support Andrew at the event. But what they didn't expect was that while Cecilia was negotiating with the event organizers, Veronica, with her striking looks, was secretly filmed in the car. The video went viral, and Andrew's team, disregarding the truth, took advantage of the buzz to promote themselves, making the situation blow up even more. Veronica was overwhelmed. Terrified that I would see it and misunderstand her relationship with Andrew, she immediately tried to suppress the trending video, hoping to have it wiped from the internet. But Cecilia, sensing something odd in Veronica's rare moment of panic, confronted her. She asked if Veronica had feelings for me, and that's why she was delaying the breakup. Meanwhile, the video had reached the top of the trending list, and Ryan had already sent it to me. Veronica was torn, but in front of Cecilia, she didn't dare admit her feelings. She feared that Cecilia, in her recklessness, might do something unforgivable to me. So she broke up with me in front of Cecilia, then brought Cecilia along to meet me, hoping that once the act was over, Cecilia would feel satisfied and leave me alone. But Andrew was much smarter than Cecilia. He saw through Veronica's predicament and used it against her. The Moo family, having made their fortune in supermarkets, was incredibly wealthy, but their business had been in decline in recent years due to the sluggish market and the rise of e-commerce to preserve the family's legacy and use Veronica's family connections to pivot the business. Andrew proposed a business engagement, a half-year deal where they wouldn't actually have to date, just maintain a low-key engagement for appearances, his leverage, that video, and the promise that Cecilia would never come near me again. The surveillance footage from all those years ago had already been deleted. Andrew had the last remaining copy. Veronica agreed. But by the time she had taken care of everything, she found that I had already blocked her. So she forced herself to stay focused playing along in front of Cecilia, her family, and friends, all while planning to come find me and explain everything once it was over. But she didn't expect me to leave, she wasn't someone who drank, yet during that time, 
She got drunk countless times. When she was sober, she'd drive back to the building where I used to live, staring up at the window of my old apartment until the lights turned off and on, only leaving once the curtains were drawn in the morning. But one night, she waited the whole night, only to never see the lights come on. She thought something had happened to me, but when she rushed upstairs, she found I was already gone. The landlord was clearing out the room, picking through what I had left behind, trying to salvage anything useful. The clothes and shoes I had bought for Veronica were thrown all over the floor, a complete mess. Her eyes welled up with tears, and she broke down sobbing in the middle of the room. The landlord was so startled, the neighbors nearly called the police, but she eventually calmed down and told the landlord she would pay to buy everything I had left and rent the apartment at an increased price. This, Cecilia learned from the landlord when she went looking for Veronica after she disappeared. On the other end of the phone, Andrew's voice was calm and low. Mr. Law, did you know? Veronica has always hated me. She despises people like us who sell ourselves out for family businesses and profit. Yet, for you and that surveillance footage, she agreed to my terms and got engaged to me. Don't you find that ironic? From a practical standpoint, Veronica and I are the most suitable pair for a marriage alliance. She's smart, and I don't dislike her. This marriage could strengthen both our families, and with my family's support, she could gain her parents' approval more quickly and inherit the family business. She really loves you and has done a lot for you, but what about you? What have you done for her? What could you do for her? From what I hear, you can't even afford to buy a house right now. Yes, I lied and carefully planned that engagement ceremony, hoping to turn it into something real. If she had any sense left, she would have realized that marrying me would be the most rational choice. But because of you, she lost her mind. She caused a huge scene at the engagement, becoming a laughingstock in our circles. And worse, she stubbornly went to find you and explain everything, enraging her family. Even if someone has the right bloodline, if they're not smart enough, they lose the right to inherit. It's hard enough for a woman to inherit the family business. Mr. Law, do you really want to ruin her life? I remained silent for a long time. I didn't want to. I couldn't bear to. So, I could only stay cold and force her to leave. Back in the present, I stared at that bouquet for a long time, so long that my eyes started to burn. Only then, with great reluctance, did I turn off the light, watching as the darkness swallowed up the light, and everything fell silent once more. Chapter 18 for the next few days, I wasn't in the best shape. Luckily, the preparation for the exhibition was already in its final stage, with the branded vehicles entering the venue. It was relatively easy work, even though I was on autopilot the entire time. Nothing went wrong. Every day, I just counted the minutes, waiting for the workday to end so I could go home and rest. But today, as I was going upstairs, I noticed that the door of the apartment next to mine was wide open, and there were quite a few suitcases piled up at the entrance, including a pink suitcase. The previous tenant had just moved out last week, and now someone new was moving in. The apartment walls were thin. I just hoped that this tenant wouldn't be like the previous couple who fought in the middle of the night. With that thought, I couldn't help but glance over a few more times. For some reason, the pink suitcase at the door felt strangely familiar. A sudden feeling of unease washed over me, and the next second, someone walked out of the apartment. A plain white t-shirt, blue jeans, long black hair pulled to one side, Veronica's delicate, beautiful face appeared. She was about to bend down to pick up her things, standing there in that old, narrow building, looking completely out of place. I was so surprised that I forgot to pull my key out of the lock halfway through turning it. Why are you still here? Didn't you leave? Veronica straightened up and met my gaze. I was going to leave, but I upset my boyfriend, and he didn't want to go home with me. So now I have to do everything I can to win him back, until he forgives me. As she spoke, her eyes stayed fixed on my face, but hearing her words, I didn't know how to respond. Fortunately, she didn't seem to expect one, as she continued, anyway, judging by the dark circles under your eyes, you haven't been sleeping well, go get some rest, once I finish unpacking, I'll treat you to a housewarming dinner, of course, as neighbors, your girlfriend won't mind, right, her voice was still a little hoarse from being sick, and the playful tone at the end, paired with her smiling eyes, reminded me of the first time we met, back then, she had chased after me on her bike, the sunlight shining on her face, her teasing voice mixed with the wind. Hey, classmate, walking and reading at the same time, aren't you afraid you'll run into a tree? How had I answered her then? I said no, but the next second, distracted by her, I nearly walked into a lamppost. She had stopped her bike and stood there laughing at me. Now, back to the present, Veronica was still looking at me, seemingly waiting for an answer. I pushed down the odd feeling in my chest, looked away, and said coldly, no need. I don't make friends with strangers, even if they're my neighbors. She shouldn't stay here. She needed to go back to her world. Chapter 19. Chapter 19. Veronica moved next door to me. After that, 
She often came over to knock on my door for some seemingly trivial matters. For example, where can I get Wi-Fi? What should I do if the door code doesn't work? What's the contact number for water delivery? As it happened more often, I realized her intentions weren't as simple as they seemed. So I started ignoring her. Or I would respond coldly, hoping she would give up. I didn't know if she had resolved her conflicts with her parents. And I had no position to ask. So I could only worry randomly. But ever since she moved in, the previously dark hallway started becoming brighter day by day. Several new shelves appeared in the stairwell, adorned with various decorations and brightly colored dolls. I even noticed a ceramic flower pot with a sunflower in it on her shoe rack, growing boldly towards the hallway's only small window. However, it seemed like the flower hadn't been watered for a few days and was starting to wilt. Maybe she had figured things out and gone back home. What are you thinking, Cameron? Someone patted me on the shoulder, snapping me out of my thoughts and I realized it was Jack, smiling at me. Tomorrow is the last day of the car exhibition. We're on break for five days starting the day after tomorrow. Got any plans, Cameron? I rubbed my neck and said, I'll probably sleep for a full day and night. Same here. Coming in every day at 7 to supervise the event is exhausting for anyone. Because of the upcoming break, the whole team, who had been working non-stop for over a month, was visibly excited. In the afternoon, we wrapped up the event, we cleaned up the site, organized the materials, and took a group photo, then it was all done. I went home after work, I dropped my bag and collapsed on the bed, completely drained. Just as I was dozing off, my phone suddenly rang, it was Ryan calling. Only then did I remember that he had said he was coming to City C over the weekend. So I quickly pulled myself together and answered the phone. Hey, when did you book your flight? But the person on the other end sounded unexpectedly excited. We'll talk about the flight in a minute. Have you seen the trending news? Andrew just announced he's leaving the entertainment industry and he's also married. Hearing Ryan's words, I woke up a bit more and instinctively gripped my phone tightly. I asked, when did this happen? There were rumors a couple of days ago, but not many people believed it. Fans were denying it everywhere, saying Andrew's career was on the rise, so there was no way he'd quit. But just now, his studio officially confirmed it and even posted his marriage certificate. Marriage certificate. I repeated those two words unconsciously, feeling conflicted. Just earlier, when I saw that flower, I was wondering if she had truly given up and gone back to the capital. But now that this guess was confirmed, I didn't feel as relieved as I thought I would. Instead, it felt like a heavy stone was pressing on my chest, making it hard to breathe. But in reality, this was exactly the result I wanted. I had been cold and rejected her harshly to make her leave and return to the world where she belonged. Ryan was still talking on the other end of the phone, but I couldn't hear a word. I had to interrupt her, saying, Ryan, something came up here. I'll call you back after I take care of it. Alright, I'm just about to catch the subway after work anyway. We can talk later when I get home. The call ended. Silence returned to the apartment. I didn't know how long I lay there. Watching the daylight outside slowly fade. A bird flew by in the gray dusk. Then, someone knocked on the door. Who could it be? I got up, dazed, and answered the door. To my surprise, it was Veronica I saw through the peephole. She had cut her hair short, with her long neck now fully exposed, making her look even more slender. What was she doing here? Did she come to reconcile after her wedding and ask for my blessing? Feeling conflicted, I opened the door. She waved the groceries in her hand at me, her expression as normal as ever. Wanna come over for hot pot? I promised to treat you after I finished moving in. No thanks, I'm not eating. But she didn't give up. What's the matter? Afraid your girlfriend will get mad. Her teasing tone made me lose all patience. No matter how good my temper was. Veronica, what are you trying to say? Since you're married, can you stop bothering me? Veronica froze for a moment when she heard that. What do you mean, married? She looked genuinely confused, as if she had no idea about her marriage to Andrew. I didn't want to say anything else and turned around, ready to close the door, but she was quicker and managed to push her way inside before I could. Cameron, what are you talking about? Who else would I marry besides you? She really wouldn't stop until she saw the truth, so I took out my phone, opened the trending news, and looked for proof. Sure enough, Ryan hadn't been lying. Hashtag Andrew quits the industry Hashtag Andrew gets married were both trending at the top of the list. I clicked on one of the topics, found a picture of the marriage certificate, and was about to show it to Veronica. But when I zoomed in, I noticed something was wrong. The woman on the marriage certificate wasn't someone I recognized. And looking more closely at the name, it wasn't Veronica either. How could this be? I was stunned. Chapter 20. Veronica leaned over to look at my phone screen. And after seeing it clearly, she sighed in relief, shaking her head with a smile. Did you think I married Andrew? I didn't respond, only now realizing that Ryan had told me Andrew got married, but never mentioned if the bride was Veronica. 
It was my own assumption. Realizing this made me feel pretty embarrassed. Veronica smiled. Her eyes curved with amusement, and patiently explained. Yesterday, I did go back to Beijing and attended Andrew's wedding. But more importantly, I talked to my parents about you and how much you mean to me. I had to clear up their misunderstandings before I could officially bring you home. Andrew just wanted a marriage alliance. He never liked me. I only went along with his charade because, well, he had something on me. But I've sorted all that out now. You once said that we come from different worlds and that's why we can't be together. But you forgot that the moment I fell in love with you, I stepped into your world. I love this world, and I don't want to leave it. So, could you give me a chance? Don't be in such a hurry to push me away. If I do something wrong, then you can kick me out later. Okay. Her gaze was both gentle and determined. It made my chest ache, and when I spoke again, my voice was tinged with emotion. I'll think about it. Will you think about it alone? Without listening to your girlfriend's opinion. She emphasized the word girlfriend, her eyes twinkling with a playful glint. It was only then that I remembered the lie I had told to make her leave, claiming that Abigail was my girlfriend. Judging by her expression, she had long since figured out that I was lying. When did you find out? I couldn't bear to leave you. After I was kicked out, I came back to see you one last time, and I realized the walls here aren't very soundproof. Some guy was calling my name in his sleep. Also, that so-called girlfriend of yours, Abigail, lives so close. Yet you always walk home separately after work. I was stunned. I hadn't expected myself to slip up so early. But after a moment, I realized something else. Wait, how did you even know where Abigail lives? That, she grinned mischievously, is a secret. Then, with a victorious smile, she added, Come on, let's go get hot pot, clear soup, nine grit spicy. I followed her to her place. But as soon as I stepped inside, I froze. Because the amount of familiar stuff in her apartment was overwhelming. From the wardrobe to the full-length mirror, down to the slippers and decorations. It was all the stuff I'd left with the landlord in Beijing when I moved out. Why is all my stuff here? Veronica had already gone into the kitchen and was washing vegetables like she owned the place. Her voice sounded a bit awkward as she answered. To save money, I had it all shipped here, including the mattress. I had struggled with sleep because the mattress in the rental was too thin. So after much hesitation, I had splurged 500 yuan on a latex mattress. We split the cost. When I moved to City C, I realized the shipping fee to bring the mattress along was outrageous, so I had to give it up, but Veronica had somehow brought all these random things over. The shipping costs alone must have far exceeded the original price, there was no way this was to save money. I chuckled, noticing how her ears turned bright red but chose not to call her out. Still, something wasn't adding up, why had she pretended to be broke back then? With that thought, I confronted her directly, Veronica cleared her throat, explaining, I, uh. Kind of boasted to my family about how I was different from other rich kids, saying I could support myself through part-time jobs while finishing school. I even forced them to freeze my credit cards. By the time I realized I'd made a mistake, it was too late, so I had to tough it out doing odd jobs. So, believe it or not, I really was super broke back then. The phone rang, interrupting her explanation. When I answered, it was Abigail. The car exhibition had ended, and the department wanted to throw a celebration dinner. She asked me when I'd be available. I'm free these next few days. Let's see what everyone else's schedule looks like. Satisfied with the answer, Abigail quickly hung up. It was only then that I noticed the sound of vegetables being washed had stopped. A head was peeking around the doorframe, clearly eavesdropping. Seeing this, I couldn't resist teasing her. I might have dinner with someone tomorrow. But before I could finish, she stepped out with a smug expression and said, You're already reporting your dinner plans to me. That means I'm on your mind. I couldn't hold back my laughter. She had seen me at my coldest. Yet she remained full of warmth. There was no point in teasing her anymore. That summer night in City C, I had hot pot with Veronica. The nine grit spicy left her speechless from the heat. Yet she filled the entire balcony with sunflowers, welcoming me to her world. Abigail, bonus chapter. My name is Abigail, and I feel like I'm being followed. After work, I went to buy groceries as usual, but while walking, I couldn't shake the feeling that someone was watching me. Every time I turned around, there was no one there. What was going on? Could it be that a rival company was behind this? Getting the contract to collaborate on the car show with the government wasn't easy for our company. Several competitors, all of similar size, had been eyeing the opportunity. From the start of the project, they hadn't stopped causing trouble, following, threatening, filing complaints, such petty tricks were all too common. Now, with less than two weeks until the car show, I was curious to see what they were planning this time. With that thought, I changed my mind. I didn't go grocery shopping. Instead, I headed to a tea restaurant near my home. I'd been there a few times before. There were no private rooms, and the tables were arranged clearly. 
With transparent glass windows that made it easy to observe the outside. Sure enough, as soon as I sat down, not long after, someone dressed all in black, with a hat and a mask, was sneakily peeking through the glass, watching the restaurant. Judging by the figure, it was a woman. She was taller than me and had a good figure, but isn't following someone usually a job for a man. To avoid alerting her, I pretended not to notice. I ordered my meal as usual, acting like I was just there to have dinner alone. I dragged out the time, and after finishing my food, I even ordered a pot of tea, pulling out my laptop to work on unfinished tasks. Finally, she got impatient. She walked in. The waiter greeted her, asking where she'd like to sit, but her eyes kept darting toward me, and as the waiter led her past my table, I reached out and grabbed her sleeve. She stiffened, refusing to look at me, staring at the ground as she asked, why are you grabbing me? That's when I realized her voice was soft, she sounded young. The visible nervousness made it clear she was probably just an intern, tricked by her boss into doing this. I softened my tone. It's nothing. I just wanted to share a table with you. Of course. She wasn't happy, trying to shake off my hand. The confused waiter also chimed in. Miss, the restaurant has plenty of free seats. There's no need to share a table. But I feel like I've known this young lady forever. And I'd like to get to know her better. And besides, you've been following me for quite a while. So I think I deserve to know who you are, right? At those words, she froze, then lifted her head to look at me. A few seconds later, she took off her mask. She revealed a young, beautiful face with long, thick lashes. The waiter was momentarily stunned, muttering softly. She must be a celebrity. No wonder she was all covered up. But to me, she seemed familiar. It wasn't until she calmly sat across from me that I remembered where I'd seen her before. Aren't you Cameron's cousin? Her name was Veronica, I think. She had been looking down at the menu, but when she heard that, she looked up with a bit of annoyance. I'm not his cousin, I frowned, remembering the scene I saw outside Cameron's house the other night. Then who are you? Why were you following me? She didn't answer, keeping her focus on the menu. After the waiter noted down her order and left, she finally spoke. She stared at me and asked, do you like Cameron? I was stunned, why are you asking? But at the same time, I was asking myself, do I like Cameron? The first time Cameron and I reconnected was back in early April, when the date for the car show had already been set. However, since it was the first time our branch was organizing an event of this scale, we lacked experience. On top of that, our competitors kept interfering, causing delays in finalizing plans with several partner brands. Progress was severely lagging, so we reported the situation to the head office in Beijing, asking for help. The head office was highly efficient, quickly organizing an online meeting to share their expertise. I was responsible for handling the connection. All the mid-to-senior level staff from the branch were present. But when the connection went live, the speaker on the screen was a young, handsome man. He looked younger than me, because he didn't match our expectations at all. The room was filled with murmurs. I was puzzled too, weren't we told that an experienced veteran would be leading the discussion? Why had they suddenly sent a rookie? But even so, I had to maintain order in the meeting. I was about to speak up, to tell everyone to quiet down. After all, the young man on the other side probably wouldn't be able to control the room. But before I could say anything, he had already started speaking. Let's save some time. You all have too many questions. His voice was clear and calm, and he pulled up a prepared PowerPoint presentation. He didn't flinch at all. Even when faced with some difficult, deliberately tricky questions from chief editor who, he remained polite and humble, saying, I don't quite see how this question relates to the event planning, but I'm sure your inquiry has deeper meaning. Chief editor whose face turned red but he had no rebuttal, who had always been a petty, harsh person. The meeting room echoed with light laughter as everyone witnessed the rebuke of editor who, the rest of the meeting proceeded exceptionally smoothly, and as for me, I couldn't help but feel a sense of admiration for the boy on the other side of the screen. After the online meeting ended, I disconnected the computer from the shared screen and began packing up my things, waiting for the others to leave so I could head out for dinner. However, before I could leave, I suddenly heard some static coming from my computer, along with faint voices in conversation. That's when I realized I had forgotten to fully disconnect the meeting call after it ended. I don't usually shut down my laptop, and I had just closed it. Realizing this, I thought of reminding the person on the other end to disconnect too, but before I could do that, I overheard a clearer voice. The person seemed to have taken their laptop into the bathroom and was now calling a friend. Hey, Rain, I finally finished the meeting. You wouldn't believe it. My boss ditched the meeting on me, said it was just a small one with two or three people but it turned out to be a huge group. I was terrified. Yeah, I'm too pitiful. I deserve a cake as a reward. The accent was familiar. The calm, professional boy I had seen in the meeting was now lively and youthful. Not wanting to interrupt, I simply shut down my computer. But after that, 
I couldn't stop thinking about the boy who had such a stark contrast between his public and private persona. After mustering up the courage, I called a colleague who had been transferred to the headquarters to ask about him. My colleague, ever the perceptive one, laughed heartily and mercilessly shattered my tiny spark of infatuation. Sister he, he has a girlfriend, and they're doing really well. Hearing that, I felt a bit disappointed, but it wasn't unexpected. In the busy adult world, endless revisions and meetings can easily bury a fleeting crush beneath layers of exhaustion. I nearly forgot about him, until early May, when I received a message from my boss. With the car show approaching, we were short on staff, and headquarters was sending an experienced manager to help me complete the project. I immediately wanted to refuse. We could easily borrow staff from other departments and hire new people after the busy period. Bringing someone new into the mix now, especially from headquarters, would likely cause friction due to their superior attitude. Not to mention the challenge of adjusting to our company's pace. But my boss insisted, saying, this person originally didn't want to come, thinking Sea City was too far, but apparently, he just broke up with his girlfriend and changed his mind. And that's when I saw the file, the boy in the resume looked composed, but I froze. His name was also Cameron. Standing in my boss's office, I couldn't help but recall the familiar accent I'd overheard through the meeting software. When I saw his previous address listed, I finally remembered the boy from my small town memories, buried for so many years. When I was 12, my parents divorced, and I moved back to my father's hometown. The small town was pleasant, but predictably unwelcoming to outsiders. I felt it more than most. At that age, being a little different makes it hard to make friends. So, I often wandered around by myself. One day, in a narrow alley, I was cornered by a stray dog. Terrified, I couldn't go home and nearly starved. That's when I met him. He saved me, and became my first friend. Now, after all these years, we were about to meet again. I felt both amazed and excited. I couldn't help but marvel at the strange twists of fate, suppressing my emotions. I agreed to the transfer from headquarters. My boss thought I was reluctantly accepting, and made heartfelt promises not to treat me unfairly, but I didn't care about that at all. Finally, the day before his arrival came, originally, Jack had been scheduled to pick him up from the airport, but his cat was about to give birth, and the timing conflicted. I approved his leave right away and volunteered to pick him up myself. Jack was surprised at how quickly I agreed, and he whispered to Eva. Wondering how the usually detached sister he had suddenly changed her ways, I chuckled. I knew I was being a bit sneaky, but then again, when you feel that spark of interest, isn't it foolish not to try and catch it? I went to the airport and saw him. He didn't seem in the best of spirits, politely but distantly greeting me. I tried to cheer him up. He smiled, the guarded look on his face softening, but he still didn't recognize me. That's okay. I wasn't in a rush. After that, he officially started working, and we became colleagues. The closer I got to him, the more I realized, he was like a boy who radiated light. And every time I thought of the look on his face when I gave him candy, surprised and confused, I couldn't help but smile. Suddenly, someone knocked on the table in front of me. I snapped back to reality, hearing the person across from me repeat her question. Do you like Cameron or not? What does that have to do with you? That's none of your business. Just answer yes or no. The girl in front of me had an aggressive stance, clearly filled with hostility. For some reason, I felt like I shouldn't back down. So I crossed my arms and met her gaze, and if I do, the girl across from me glared in frustration before saying, you'd better give up, he doesn't like girls like you, that made me laugh, he doesn't like girls like me, what, does he like girls like you instead, that's right, you guessed it, she replied, taking off her cap and looking at me challengingly, even as a fellow woman, I had to admit she was very beautiful, I vaguely remembered Jack mentioning her, saying that Cameron had been deeply hurt by an ex who had cheated on him, every time Cameron talked about her, his mood would darken, looking at this girl in front of me, with her complicated expression, I suddenly had a suspicion, are you Cameron's ex? She frowned at that, correcting me somewhat unhappily, temporarily, I'm temporarily his ex, I narrowed my eyes, my tone no longer so polite, you've already broken up, isn't it a bit inappropriate to still be bothering him? I'm not trying to bother him, then why are you following me, trying to force me to give up, do you think if I leave, he'll have no choice but to forgive you? My words must have hit a nerve. Her expression darkened, and she bit her lip. After a long pause, she finally spoke quietly. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to bother you. I just wanted to confirm if he's really with you. If you two really are together, and he genuinely likes you, then I want to know what kind of person you are. If you're a good person, I'll choose to wish you well and leave. But if you're not together, I need to understand who you are. I've wronged him, and I want to do everything I can to win him back. So I need to know my competition. There was sincerity in her voice. Her gaze firm. Women can often tell when another is lying. I was surprised by her honesty, I hadn't expected her to be so forthright and bold. And besides, 
She didn't seem like the type to cheat. Jack's information must have been wrong. Curiosity got the better of me. So I asked, how did you two break up? She looked up, her expression clearly saying, nice try. She took a sip of tea and asked instead, and how do you know where Cameron lives? Our eyes locked, and we both fell silent. I silently concluded that this girl was cautious, a difficult opponent. We sat there until the cafe was about to close, and the server came over to ask us to leave, because I hadn't been able to get any useful information from her. I felt a bit disappointed. As a test, I suggested. Want to go somewhere else? Sure. She replied quickly, clearly having the same idea. We left the cafe. Now I had to figure out where to take her. City C never sleeps, especially in this area, where there's a huge plaza nearby. Even though it was almost midnight, the square was still buzzing with people, stalls selling food, drinks, and games stretched out as far as the eye could see. Occasionally, a little car would drive by, full of kids laughing. I was about to check a review app for ideas when someone approached us. It was a young girl with flyers, her bright smile revealing a mouthful of white teeth. Hey, ladies, our new store just opened, and we're running a balloon popping contest. If you follow our WeChat account, you can get a free dart, and everyone wins a prize. Want to give it a try? I waved her off, ready to decline, but the girl was so enthusiastic that I glanced in the direction she pointed. Not far away was a temporary stage. Three giant dartboards stood in the center, covered in countless colorful balloons. Next to them was a wall filled with plush toys as prizes. There were plenty of people participating, and most of the top row of toys had already been won. The last one left on that row was a bright yellow sunflower plush. I remembered that Cameron's WeChat avatar was that same sunflower. If I won it and gave it to him, where's the QR code? I want to join. I was still thinking when I heard Veronica's voice behind me. My heart sank, and I had only one thought. I couldn't let her beat me. I quickly scanned the code too. The two of us rushed to get our darts and joined the line. The girl running the booth seemed confused, not understanding why two people who had looked so disinterested were suddenly so eager. Each of us got 10 darts. You had to hit 5 targets to win a stuffed toy. Otherwise, you'd just get a keychain as a souvenir. Obviously, we both had our eyes on the last remaining sunflower plush. I don't think I've ever been this serious about throwing darts in my life, but thankfully, persistence pays off. I managed to win the toy before she did. Veronica spent the whole time glaring at the plush in my hands. The little kids really wanted that toy, you know. Must feel good to steal it from them, doesn't it? But I was in a great mood. Oh, I'm perfectly fine with that. And because of that, by the time we sat down for drinks, our competitive streaks were in full swing. Neither of us was willing to back down. Then, both of us ended up drunk. I think you've had enough. Maybe you should stop. But even as I said that, I wasn't much better off myself. My tolerance wasn't great either. I was barely holding on and didn't want to give in in front of her. I'm not drunk. It's just hot in here. Making my face red. She was still pretending. Standing up to go to the bathroom. What I didn't expect was that she tried to play dirty. Sneaking around behind me to steal the plush toy I had hidden under my chair. Caught in the act. She sheepishly returned to her seat. Your reflexes are pretty quick. I couldn't help but tease her. Can't win. So you resort to stealing. Isn't that a bit low? Her face. Already red. Flushed even more as she looked down in guilt. But Cameron really liked that toy. After saying that. She suddenly stood up and slammed the table. I'm sorry. I was wrong. We agreed to play fair. And I shouldn't have tried to steal your toy. She was so loud that a lot of people in the bar turned to look. As mortifying as that was. What happened next was even harder to explain. Because I also stood up and patted her on the shoulder. And loudly praised her. Well said. You may not be as pretty as me. But you've got a great personality. That's nonsense. How am I not prettier than you? I'm definitely better looking. Let's compare. Fine. Let's do it. The next morning when I woke up, I found a video on my phone. Two completely drunk women, both trying desperately to keep their faces away from the camera. You go in front, or else my face will look huge. No way. Your face is already big. It won't matter. The crowd of onlookers seemed thoroughly entertained. I buried my head in my pillow in utter despair. Drinking causes nothing but trouble, and I couldn't believe how much trouble this caused. The only consolation was that neither of us had completely lost our minds and sent the video to Cameron to ask him who was prettier. But I still remembered, as Veronica and I stumbled home, that she seemed to cry, despite being totally drunk, repeating over and over, that she was truly sorry, and hoped for forgiveness. Her voice was so sincere that I felt moved, but that didn't mean I was willing to give up the person I liked. Fair competition is the greatest respect for your opponent. So, after the car show ended, on the night before I was about to go on vacation, I called Cameron. I wanted to ask him out for dinner. As the phone rang, my palms were sweaty. But I forced myself to stay calm and asked, when do you have some free time? Can we grab dinner together? Sure, 
I'm free these next few days. He sounded cheerful, but then he asked. Is this for the company celebration dinner? Can I bring a friend? I froze. Panicked. I changed my tone, saying, yeah, it's for the company. The car show was a big success, and everyone worked hard, so we're celebrating. Once the date's set, I'll have Jack let you know. He chatted with me for a bit in a friendly, relaxed tone, but there was nothing romantic in it, just the politeness between colleagues. After hanging up, I stood in the hallway, staring at the small sunflower plant in front of Veronica's door for a long time. It was the first time I understood what it meant to win the game but lose in life. I couldn't help but laugh at myself. Then took the sunflower plush toy I'd been carrying in my bag and placed it next to her plant. Then I turned and walked downstairs. It's okay. At least I tried and won't have any regrets. Surrendering without a fight is the real disgrace.